So following the launch of Lifelines in New Orleans, we decided to take this 10 city tour. We went all across the country and we made an effort to respond to the demand that was happening literally from pastors and faith leaders and directly impacted folks. And so some of you uh, were part of that tour. We came to our cities, we launched uh, the gun violence prevention work. So I'd love to just hear some, some of your quick reflections. Tenny, uh, we first decided to focus our work on learning the lessons of the Boston 10 point plan. You were there along with uh, Reverend Eugene Rivers and uh, Reverend Jeff Brown as a part of the architects of the 10 point plan in Boston. You remember some of those trips, what stands out for you? The energy that you brought, I felt that there is a chance this will really continue and maybe build up again. You know, the lessons of Boston's were great, they were a lot of technical and how we work together, but it was also fallouts. And I felt the purity of the heart that I knew the black tribe got to save itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we met, I felt the knowledge is going to be put in good hands and it's going to be carried in a way that's going to have dignity and the right priority because your people are hurting. And I was just happy, really joyed to be part of it. Uh, Demita, when we came to Oakland, brought the tour to Oakland, we brought Jeff Brown and you were organizer at the time. And we started night walks. We started to literally organize people to respond to the violence in the street. Talk a little bit about what it, what it was like in those early years to walk the streets of Oakland and bring people out into the neighborhoods on Friday night to Saturday nights. So it was a little frightening at first, mm. but it also was liberating. Um, that folks who, the ordinary folks like myself at the time, could actually do something to contribute to re the reduction of gun violence in the city, even if it, as um, another McBride used to call it, a ministry of presence and silence, mm -hmm. where we were just in the community. We actually started September 14, 2012, and Jeff Brown out of Boston had come out and did some training and told us the two key things was to be consistent and persistent and the city was ready for it. We're, talking, we're not talking about city officials, we're talking about those folks in the community. They had been waiting for something that they could do on their own, on their own terms, and this was it. And it actually, uh, up until the pandemic, every Friday night, with the exception of holidays, um, they walked the streets of East, deep East Oakland and carried the message that we love you and we want you to be free. Antonio, you, uh, you joined on the tour, and we went to about 10, 11 cities over the course of 90 days. Seemed like the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> what city stood out for you, and, and, and what are some of your best memories as relates to what we did in those cities? I mean, to me, what stands out is that people were so amazed that there were strategies that worked. So when Tenney, uh, Jeff Brown, Eugene Rivers talked about Boston, they were like, this could be done. So like Reverend Domingo was saying, this is something we could actually put into practice. And so all these families who had been going through this for years, who felt hopeless, all of a sudden, hmm, there's yes. something we can do. And that was, it was like sharing the good news. Mm. Tenny, when we went to some of these cities, we would uh, do panel conversations. We would meet with some of the individuals in the neighborhoods who were thought to have driven a lot of the conflict. We would meet with law enforcement. We, we, we would meet with all, all kind of folk. But one of the things I remember you saying one time is, you're Israeli, and so you, you know, used to always kind of tell that story. T talk about the relevance of, you know, people don't build parks in war zones. And it seemed like in, a, in the United States, mm -hmm. we weren't trying to end the war in the black and brown community. We're just trying to get folks to get used to playing in parks and going to schools while a war is happening. Compare, com just re recount that. So I'm an Israeli and a Yugoslav, and I was used to say people don't care about test scores in math in Sarajevo when it's being bombed, right? Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do here, a lot of funders and policymakers trying to do early childhood and all those things, things we care a lot about, but you can't do that when the trauma keeps going on. You've got to do both. Uh, a friend is a former chief, Dean Esselman, always says, America is a cyclope. It can focus on one thing at a time. <laughs> and we've got to do two things at a time. We've got to reduce the heat of the violence, and we've got to invest in children in a young age and neighborhoods so they'll never get to us. 
Uh, and I think that was really the impetus. And initially, it was really hard to convince. We had a lot of rejections, a lot of puzzles. People wanted to pick a piece, usually maybe strengthening law enforcement or make them a bit more moderate. And I, I got to say, the team was always very consistent. And we got to really bring up the voice of the people. Demita, so the success of Oakland is that we were able to um, get some buy-in uh, from elected officials, from police chiefs, from community members, but it didn't start with buy-in. Talk a little bit about the organizing we had to do to get folks to say yes. So you want me to bring up some trauma in my life, huh? <laughs> So we had to do good old-fashioned organizing. And what, is good, what is good old-fashioned organizing? Um, talking to the people, um, again, um, delivering the message and getting a partnership, building from that. Um, we actually had one failed attempt at, um, at the ceasefire strategy in Oakland because all of the partners weren't bought in. So we had to do um, political organizing. We had to do community-based organizing. We had to, um, faith community was the leaders in this organizing and it had to come from the ground up. You know, it couldn't be from top down, but it was from the ground up where the community started demanding something to save the lives of the black and brown young men in Oakland, because that's who was mostly dying. And demanding 2,000 folks showed up at a demonstration before the mayor saying, we want this, we need this. And that started to turn things around. Um, and then we got a mayor and a police chief, and a couple other folks who actually said, oh, let's try it. And we continue, it was a continuous organizing job to continue to educate both the community and the politicians on the success that had happened, Boston Miracle, um, I think High Point, North Carolina had been the recent success place. So, you know, doing research and bringing that research and demonstrating that it can be done. Our communities are not um, out or for nothing, they're not zeroed out. 10 years later, Antonio, <laughs> we are listening to a conversation literally right now happening about Build Back Better America. Mm -hmm. And talk about what's happened in 10 years, thanks to the work that many of us and certainly others who aren't here today. Yeah, I mean, in cities all over the country, like Oakland, people had to dig this out just fighting with mayors and police chiefs and everyone else trying to get it happen city by city. So now we have an opportunity to get federal assistance, right? We need to do this at scale with numbers that only the federal government can provide. So we're at the point where we could get $5 billion for this, which is something we never really dreamed of before. We might have dreamed of it, but it seems so far off. And now we're at a point where we could do this at scale, mm -hmm. hiring thousands of people to do this full-time professionally to make peace. All right, well, uh, we, we run out of time, so I'm gonna ask all of you uh, to share what is your greatest hope or a great hope you have for the next 10 years of the work related to um, Live Free and all of its connected parts. Tim. I see that this is maturing into black and brown leadership and activism and work all around the country and infrastructure, so you're in charge of your future in, in a beautiful, powerful way. And, that to me will be the America worth living in and I'm just seeing it. I want the momentum to continue. Mm. Tom. So for me, it would be that this community violence intervention become a household word, household phrase. So right now when there's a mass shooting, people go to background checks and assault rifle bans, right? That is just muscle memory. People go to those things. I want for people to go to this, mm. right? So that people in every city, automatically start arguing for we need community-based solutions whenever there's shootings in their neighborhood. That will, that will be the key to making this ubiquitous around the country. So he stole some of mine, but that this work is actually an intricate part of our nation, mm -hmm. that it becomes a part of the structure, that these are professional jobs, these are necessary jobs, just like nurses and doctors, mm -hmm. that the people who do this work are necessary to this country and to our communities. Well, thank y'all for the work. Thank y'all for the walk down memory lane. Let's keep it going. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.